Holly Cotton here, and I am joined today with six-time Grammy-nominated independent artist Yazara Odoro, who has worked with Erica Badu, Lenny Kravis, Madonna, so you know, put some respect on her name. She's been out here doing the darn thing. So we're actually going to talk to her today about her current project that she's working on, as well as we have a serious topic that we want to talk to you guys about, and we will, hopefully we can educate and inspire people that are going through something that's actually really, really common when we're talking about co-parenting and custody and things like that. So welcome, Yazara. Hi. Hi, Holly. How you doing? Good, good, good. So when I uh, when I have an artist or a, not an artist, when I have a guest that comes on, I always like to read the bio uh, from their media kit and especially with artists because I love hearing those stories about how you guys sort of found your passion with becoming that person that is in, in living your, your dream that you've had for however long. So I know for you, I know for you, you actually have a very interesting story, one with your name and two with your African roots. So kind of give us an idea. One, I know you want to drop that information because it's such a cute story about the 29 uh, heirs and then here comes Yazara. And then also, I know it's a very, uh, very sweet story about how you were basically born to be a, a singer or a musician. So tell us those yes. stories first. Absolutely. Um, first, uh, I am proud to say that I'm a first generation Ghanaian American from Washington, D.C. I am the descendant of a proud black American woman. Um, and a Ghanaian father. My dad was a um, a political, actually, figure in uh, Ghana, West Africa, who had a paper and was a, I guess, would have been a blogger now, but he had his own paper in the, in the um, largest printing company in all of West Africa. And he swept my mom off her feet while she had malaria, saved her, made her feel better, and that's how I came to be. Um, and over time, as I became more acquainted with who I am and... Uh, decided I wanted to rename myself by naming myself. Uh, I decided to go back to my roots and claim the name of my grandmother in Ghana, West Africa, whose name was Yaa Ajinkoma. And she uh, died at the age of 103, still farming, called my dad up and told him she was ready to go and to please send video recordings of her grandchildren so that she could see their faces before she met her maker. And uh, Zara the flip of my grandmother, Sarah. My grandmother, Sarah, was a black American woman from here, from, from here in the United States. And she was a prodigy pianist who gave up her career and uh, landed into motherhood uh, at a time where she could have gone to college if people had allowed her to be, you know. But in those days, women had to sacrifice a great deal in order to be who, you know, the world wanted them to be. So a shotgun wedding she had, and my, she took care of my mother. And my grandfather left when my mom was eight years old and got his degree while my mom and my grandmother sacrificed. So when I hear the name Yazara, it reminds me not to shrink. Um, it reminds me of the 29 plus children that my grandmother Nana Ya raised and my father being the only surviving male heir. It reminds me to sit in my seat of power. Um, just like I'm here with you right now, talking about the music that made me and the things that are going on in my life right now. I love that. I love that story. Okay, so Yazara, whenever whenever we hear people talking about loving music, wanting to be an artist, and sort of living that lifestyle, a lot of times they don't have success in that. You know, you just like... For me, I love singing in the shower, but I know no one's going to ever give me a record contract. So, <laughs> so, so to see someone that's had the passion their entire life and actually live in that is very inspiring. So not only did you get to live that passion, but you also were, like you said, nominated several times for awards for that. So kind of give us some of your musical background and into how you even got nominated for a Grammy. Well, I also want to make sure I, I, I want to make sure I correct this because folks love to Google and fact check. Oh. I was considered six times for oh. a Grammy okay. as an independent artist who is not on a major label label. And there's some people who live their entire lives and never be able to say their name synonymous with a Grammy. So I think of right. that as, as I will pump that as clout six <laughs> 
considerations in one, in one category um, right. are a big deal for me as an independent. And in 2010, um, I came out with the record, The Ballad of Purple St. James on the Foreign Exchange label as a collaboration between theirs and my label. And um, a lot of people know me for that record. Some may, may also know me for the record I made in 2003 uh, called Black Star, which was backed by Bob Johnson and uh, on Marcus Johnson's label, Three Keys. And most recently, I've, re I've now released my most recent venture, which is self-produced um, along with uh, self-executive produced along with Raheem Devon and several other producers whom I really love called The Ceremony. Uh, it's the most intimate record I've ever made in my career. I, I made it while I was singing for really great people and learning from really amazing folks like Lenny Kravitz, um, using all of the tools I learned with Erica Badu, um, experiencing very interesting facets of life um, and artistry with Madonna and Elvis Costello and the likes. And I used those resources that I made to, one, keep me as close to my son as possible so I could provide for him, but also be able to tell these stories. And um, I feel very proud of myself because Sink or Swim was the thing I did for myself, was the story I told for myself. And I released it uh, 2020 on the 21st of February. Uh, during the pandemic and most people would have said I was crazy for doing that but I knew that the songs were anthems for people to live to because I was living various serious and important things in my life while I was making these records like running um like beautiful ashes okay got it got it now let me ask you this just to kind of piggyback on what you just said oh so how did it feel because again you know you hear people's names that are in, in that are successful musicians that have been in you know doing this for a long time and so they definitely have a respect that comes with being in the room with those those people and not only were you in the room but you actually were working with some of these big name artists so kind of tell us how did that happen because you can always be an independent artist but then once you have that collaboration with a headliner it's totally different so how did you sort of figure out how to get in those arenas where now you're working with Lenny Kravis and Madonna uh Erica Badu how did you do it give us the secret <laughs> um, serendipity you know mm. I, I I really um, as I sit in it and I think about it I've experienced some very experienced some extremely challenging personal things um, but the phrase that the universe will make room for your gift has truly been my story I never asked for an audition I never went seeking an audition the music found me just like the calling did as a, as a child. You know, I was singing back, I was singing at Duke Ellington School of Performing Arts and a group of kids came in from Howard University. One of the student teachers was from Howard and their friend. I ended up singing um, and auditioning to be in their group. One of them started singing background for Erica Badu, called me up while I was in my first year of college, killing, not killing it, like flunking it. <laughs> and, um, you know, said to me, hey, Badu is looking for somebody in Dallas, but I want somebody who's good. And I think my story is always being ready so I didn't have to get ready. I mean, it, it wasn't about the connections as much as it was about me having a reputation for being easy to work with, uh, for working in kindness and working hard. And I was always able to wear lots of hats. You know, with Badu, I used to do Badu's hair. I'd do her locks. I would be in college, you know, squirreling my money away so I could have some locks too. Um, when I was with Lenny, I would source clothing. I never forget one day being in a rehearsal and um, Lenny, who has an incredibly visionary brother named Rodney Burns, uh, who is the fashion behind so many people besides just him, he walked in and he said to Rodney, he said, I want everybody to look like Yazara. And for me, that was validation um, that the universe will, will make room and maybe my burn is a little slower than some people's has been, but all your favorite singers know who I am. So it's only a matter of time that you will too, that because your callings will leave room, just like yours have Holly. Like when you told me about what you do, like you do all the things, <laughs> you do all the things you inspire me, you know? So when we are in, you and I are independent of other people mm -hmm. telling us what we did is we have to do or where, when and where we enter. And I think that's the difference between me and some of the artists I've worked with. I've had the blessing of leveling up those rooms and using what I've learned there as well uh, to level up my own. 
I love that. I love that. Yeah. I always say that when you're living your passion and all you're giving out is positive energy, only positive energy will gravitate towards you. So that will come across that someone will be like, man, I love her spirit. I want to work with her more. I want more of that. And it, it's just like, it's just a form of networking, but it's all about energy. So yes, Definitely. I love that. I love that. Definitely. And, and, I love that. It, and I had to learn how to Go ahead. network. I had to learn how to network recently because because so much of what I do is based upon like just meeting and greeting and all of a sudden something happens. I think we live in a new world where the question is, what do you do? And now people network. But there used to be a time, especially when I came of age, it was 1997. I ain't telling you how old I am, but y'all can do some math. And I was, you know, 18 years old. And these things were coming towards me because I also always also believed that the universe would make room for me. And, and, and I keep saying that because sometimes the network may not be the thing to put you on. It may be the self-encouragement that does. Mm -hmm. Well, I just want to selfishly say that I'm so jealous that you were with Lenny Kravitz. <laughs> I just kept my eyes averted for four years, girl. I just kept my feet. I know. I was about to say, because Lenny, Lenny been fine since he, since he turned 18, probably fine before then. But it's like, does this man ever age? I need, I need his energy for Andy's sure. sweet girl. And he's as nice as he, he's as beautiful inside as he is outside. And I just kept my eyes averted because I do not play at work. I know. I know. I know. We got well, to pay I, ourselves. I ain't going to, I ain't going to do look, it so much. I, I, I don't have, <laughs> I, I don't do. have it. I don't have a professional relationship with him, so I can lust freely. <laughs> yes, honey. Let, let me know, honey. I, I approve. I will de I will put something down in the DMs. Have you met my friend Holly? Any right, right. right. <laughs> and she's super cute. Yeah. No. <laughs> and, and she works out, baby. She works out. I love, she's a dietitian. Right. I, love I love it. I love it. So I know that we're talking about you as an artist, but there's also something that we want to talk about that's serious today. And it's something that's very common. And it's about co-parenting and life after being, you know, with, with your spouse. And sometimes it's not always a pleasant breakup. Sometimes the, the co-parenting is not as easy as they make it seem on TV. I know as a single mom, I too have struggled with having a baby daddy drama. <laughs> so, yeah, all these hurt feelings making people hurt people. You know? Right, right, right. But before we go into that, I wanted to just talk about how your album, The Ceremony, was inspired by some of these events. And so when people are listening to this record and people are, are listening to the words that you're saying and you want them to take away some of the feeling and the emotions that you put into that, can you give us some insight into how you started coming up with the songs, how you were writing, what were you going through, what were the feelings, what do you want people to take away from this album? Okay, is profanity okay before I move forward? <laughs> Girl, <laughs> knock yourself out. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. So when I finally started to really be able to dig my heels into writing the ceremony, it was right after I had um, made a very agonizing decision regarding my son and co-parenting. Um, I want to say something first, and, and maybe some of y'all get this tomorrow. Somebody's not going to possibly want to be with you anymore. It is not the end of the world. If you have children with these people, it becomes our responsibility not to crack the egg. And when I say not to crack the egg, it means to move on, to get your therapy, to find your own happiness, to cheer on the person who is co-parenting with you because the person is co-parenting with you and you don't want your kid on someone's couch talking about how badly this went. So for me, the ceremony became my therapist. It became my space to talk about this in a way that would be uh, a cool place for me to air out my feelings without doing damage to myself or um, not checking myself before I wreck myself. <laughs> and the very first song uh, that I did on uh, the ceremony was a, a record called Beautiful Ashes. And I, I, I love this record because it happened on accident. I was in a session with Raymond Angry. Raymond Angry is one of the main producers on the ceremony. And he's produced for Joss Stone, The Roots, Solange, Knowles, you name it. He's an incredible producer. And he took a chance on me and just 
I, I didn't pay a penny for these records. These are people who believed in me and wanted to see me win specifically because of what I was going through in regards to my afterlife as a divorcee. And most importantly, because of me as an artist and their belief in my character and a human and wanted to see me tell these stories. And so he started playing the keys because most of the songs we did together were from scratch. And he started playing these keys and I started to feel sick. Have you... Holly, I can ask you, have you ever felt so emotionally tied to something? Maybe it made you feel hungry or ravenous or or maybe you were just so moved or so angry you cried or so sad you might have felt sick. Um, all of these emotions came over me until I finished writing the song, until I finished writing it. And it went over several ideations, um, iterations, pardon me. I wrote four different versions of, of Ashes. The first version was me, was a big fuck you to everybody because look I'm stronger I'm better I'm wiser and I'm better despite you and then the next one was wait thank you thank you for challenge because if it hadn't have happened this best version of version of me that I'm meeting right now the one that doesn't feel worthless because I don't have what others have or or um a person who is not I'm not responsible for where I started, but I am for where I end up. And Beautiful Ashes is a story of me understanding that sometimes the forest has to burn down so a new thing can grow in it. And the ceremony is a story about that, and people are living that right now. So in 2020, when I released it, when nobody was paying attention in the world but the people who needed it, I felt it was important to give it to the world. And now it's a brand new record because we have brand new reasons to grow again. Hmm. I love that. I love that. Yeah. And I think that, um, I think also, um, I love the way you explain the emotions that, that you felt, because I think that a lot of times whenever you are so invested in something and you believe in it so hard, it's like you get so emotionally attached to it and you're just like, it has to win. This has to, there is no other option but for this to be successful. I, like right. I'm putting too much in this for it to not take off. So I understand everything you said when you were talking about the analogy about the emotions. So I love that. I love that. Yazara, I know that in this album, we're talking about a lot of things that were on a personal level. We use, uh, like you said, you were given some analogies earlier about some of the things that you're going through with your son and legal battles with that whole co-parenting and not to go into the specific details of it, but I know that there are a lot of women that can definitely learn from your story that also can relate to your story. So can you give us whatever you feel comfortable with, with as far as when we're talking about some of the things that you were surprised is, is are battles that you're going through now with just trying to get custody issues and, and all of that with your son? Well, first, let me say, you know, I've seen a, uh, there's a great deal of embarrassment and shame I've had to demand of myself to release on this subject so that I could speak of it frankly and as honestly as possible in a way that can create change and and, and hopefully stop more division, at least in my case. Um, I have heard stories like mine that are a mix of, if, if this is a, 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 a a Tyler Perry movie, we would say politics. We would say um, cronyism. We would say elitism. We would say financial abuse. We would say abuse of power. We would say abuse of privilege. And in that case, I um, speak as a woman, as a black woman, firstly. The burden of proof always when something is happening to us is to prove that it's happening to us. Um, and so when I speak about, you know, being a black woman in America and that all with the burden of proof always being not what happened to her, how can we help being, what did she do? Um, as a performing artist, I've always been questioned about why my son is not living with me. And it is uh, an interestingly layered conversation having to do with a position that many women who were once the wife, housewife, 
with a husband who was the main breadwinner experience. Um, a divorce can send a woman from uh, being a human being who was living with privilege, who was able to take care of her children and live with them every day, um, to being a, somebody who cannot afford to have them present because uh, someone else has just enough money to keep them in court long enough to, for them to lose everything. I've uh, talked to women who have spent so much money they had to file bankruptcy just to um, re regain their parental rights, keep their parental rights, get their child support, um, protect their bodies. <laughs> um, and in my case, um, at least two of the things are true of me, custody and child support, which have been daunting um, the first time around because of cronyism, the second time around because of classism, and possibly, let me rephrase that, let me rephrase that, um, financial abuse of power and elitism. Um, the court system works like this. You should be able to represent yourself as a pro se person. And if you can file those motions and you've a 75 to 85% chance, if that person knows somebody or can make a call or has more money because it's about $10,000 retainer to actually get a family court lawyer to spend the time 10000 is the baseline price. Um, however, I've been told now to upwards of $30,000, $40,000. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm at go, GoFundMe status, which I never thought I'd be. Um, but I'm not the only one. Um, what I've had to realize is that when I asked for assistance and help, um, time was of the essence for me. Um, Post-COVID, things are very different for me than they were uh, before COVID. Plenty of work money opportunities that were present and the landscape for artists have changed um, for many of us and not only myself many other women are finding themselves in the same position I am right now fighting for their space um, to be able to co-parent um, while other grievances are, that are unclear are being aired out that have nothing to do with not cracking the egg that's what I'll say in my case um, we have the story of a very powerful, well-known, and very well-respected lawyer. We have a beautiful human who is now the dean of religion <laughs> at Harvard. We have a performing artist who sings rock and roll and occasionally performs in body paint. Well, something happens where they have to stand up for themselves. And the reason I'm coming forward is because now I know for the millions of women all over the world who are experiencing the same thing I am. For the artists who you know and love, who have gone through this, sometimes not for a few months, not for a, a, a few years, but, but decades of not seeing their children, um, men and women. But I'm speaking on behalf of women because I only know what it's like to be me. And um, I'm very grateful that I have my music to lean on and mental health and people who believe in me. And, you know, in 48 hours, I was able to raise $7,000 towards being able to pay for my retainer. And not every woman will be able to do that. And in places like Atlanta, Georgia, where um, the court system seemed to be very preferential to fathers and, um, you know, is the seat of black excellence, but also seat to another conversation called good fences. Um, mine is one of those perfect storms that um, my intention and hope is uh, that at the end of it, in my situation, um, my opportunity to not only co-parent, but also to continue to raise my son in place in my own home, um, where he has been splitting his time his entire life with no custody agreement until some very crazy, I won't say crazy, some very interesting things took place and... Um, I'm glad that I'm in a position to be able to speak on it where people like you care enough to listen to me, but there are, are women all over the world. I've gotten emails from as far as London and Portugal and, you know, as close as Chicago, D.C., Detroit, Atlanta, Georgia, and New York. Um, and you'd be shocked the things that are happening to women all over this country who are, are great moms but just don't have the funds. And and the judicial system is protecting them because they can't afford a lawyer. I know what it's like to step in front of a judge with motions looked over by paralegals and lawyers and be told, no, we're not even going to look at it. And it'd be illegal 
when it happened and have no one. And I'm very grateful um, to people like Big Daddy Kane, let me shout him out right now, Lenny Kravitz, um, members of my musical community who are dear friends of mine who know how much I love my son and have seen us together, who have assisted me um, so far, and I'm still paying. I'm still paying. I'm, I'm, I'm running out of money. But, you know, I'm, I don't feel good about asking anymore. Um, what I do want people to do for me is to be aware and to know that there are three sides to every story, the two people involved in that, which is the truth, and, um, and that the judicial system, particularly in family court justice, needs more oversight. It has become a cash cow where justice is no longer taking place in most cases, and it's only going to the highest bidder no matter what's happening in the child's actual life. You know, the things I had to beg for that were essential to my son's happiness, thank God he has them. And whether he ends up at home with me and having them again with me, um, I'm very glad that because I stood up for myself and for him, that a lot of those things he's getting. And I have to look at my victory story. I can't look at someone else's. Um, my, I won't call it my fight. Um, my conversation in parenting is still ongoing. But you're listening to me. But what about the people who are not listening? Um, I want to shout out Deborah Nixon Bowles and her organization who assists women who have been victims of domestic violence. I didn't know that having to call my husband at the time to be able to ask for enough money to buy a box of tampons and him only sending me 50 bucks <laughs> when I'm, you know, in another country or, or, or in New York doing an audition. And, you know, I just didn't know that well before I had my son, I was in a specific situation. And even in writing those songs for records like The Ballad, um, The Ceremony, Hear Me, my first record, I was chasing something. And part of my story isn't just the judicial system, but also about loving myself. Uh, we are chasing things. Many of us that have to do with our childhoods, our desires to find love and people who, you know, maybe it's just not for us. And we, we hold on to things that are not for us. And yes, my story is about my son, but this music is, is so much bigger than this situation. I am not a victim. I'm a healing individual because I'm out here getting and reclaiming things. And I have people who will listen in that process. People like Loveland Vouchers who will pay for me to be able to continue to, to see my therapist because I'm a sane woman, but shit, I am human. You know, I'm trying to battle for my career, for my ability to be heard in a, in a justice set system that only sees money. And I didn't want to believe that before my first day in court. You couldn't have told me that I was going to come in there. And I still haven't actually said a full phrase. Like, I've actually not really ever, I've still yet to be heard in court while having had three, yeah, while well, having had now three hearings. So let me ask you this. Whenever, whenever people think about custody battles, they always have this preconceived notion that it's going to be a mom that has custody of the kid and the dad is fighting for custody. And there is a reason that the dad is not seeing the child or, you know, it's always the mom is usually the person and the dad is the one that's fighting for those custodial rights. So what I wanted to share your story for was to kind of highlight that that is not always the case. That's not always the scenario. No. And, and it's so not. whenever someone hears this snip or this piece, because of course your story is huge and we're only exposing little bitty parts of the battle that you've been going through all of this time. So what do you feel like is the hardest part with whenever a mom is the person that's going through it and you do have the husband that, like you said, that has the, the connections and the networks and he's able to get more, I guess, uh, attention for his side than you. So what is the main thing that you want women to know that, hey, whenever you're dealing with a custody battle on this side, 
these are some things that I learned along the way that I want to share with you so that you don't have the same experience that I have. Well, first thing is, is to lead in peace. Um, it took me seven years to get to this moment. Seven years of really leading in, in love and really trying to not rock the boat because I didn't want to be on television. <laughs> I didn't want to have to talk about these things. And I have to deal with the questions where someone said, why, why did you wait so long? And, you know, my wait so long might be different than someone else's. And also, you know, let me say again, you know, I, I'm the one that's being public. Um, the other side is just able to make calls I can't. And, um, and I wouldn't even usually have said it out loud, but I just don't want to regret. I don't regret. I don't want to regret not fighting. I want my son to know that I did everything. From the beginning to lead in peace. You want to be able to tell your children that what you wanted was family vacations with two sets of co-parents. What you wanted was shared birthday parties and shared friendships with each other's friends, children's parents, and with their children so the child sees a cohesive arc of love around them. Um, shared conversations about medical and choices for schools because you know that child best, you and that person that made that child parent that child together, not other people. Um, but also, it's just to make sure you check yourself before you wreck yourself. Don't just be in there because you're mad at somebody. Um, I had every reason. I have every reason. And I won't talk about it on screen either. There is an immortalized piece of paper who's, that speaks to it. That is a document that I don't mind people reading that I have shared that talks about what my situation was. What my emotional abusive situation was that if I wanted to be vindictive and drag somebody for filth, I could have done it 12 years ago. I love all the people involved, including my ex-husband, as a human being and a member of the human race. If you can't tell yourself that and you haven't gotten through it to a therapist and had a conversation, don't go walking into court and shaking the shit out of your kid because there is no way to do this without some emotional bloodshed. And the first person if one of the people in that courtroom are so blinded by their dislike for the other parent, it's going to be your kid who feels conflicted. So make sure that your child has a therapist. Fight for it if your child is not with you. Whether the kid is smiling and doing cartwheels in class, make sure that they have somebody to talk to to navigate getting over the both of you. Mm. And then fight vigorously until you can't no more. And find resources because they are out there. I have found them. And blessed because of my position, people have found me. And I'm still in the hole, y'all. So go ahead and go fund me, y'all. I don't care. <laughs> but I'm also out here making music. Support that, too. Because I never wanted to be out here begging for anything. And I'm not going to beg. But if mine is a movement that you care about and helping reunite me with my son full time, because I have the time. And I want the chance, which was what I was promised and never given. And now the judicial system is assisting in that crime against my motherhood and my reproductive rights. And I'm not the only one. There are people who you know and love whose music you listen to right now who haven't seen their children in years. Because they can't afford it. Buy their records. Go to their shows. If you went to the Renaissance, don't even call me to get on my list. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Oh. Uh, Oh, so if you pay five thousand dollars, don't call me to get off my. I list. know that's right. I know that's right. I, I ain't got no money right now, girl. I'll get you any go for me. That's okay. I'll wait. Mm -hmm. Or if you can't, then buy the ticket. If, mm -hmm. if I went down the list of women who have called me that you know and love, mm -hmm. you wonder why they haven't put out another record. It's because they're trying not to lose their minds right now. They miss their children, and that's brothers too. But I can only speak from me. All right. And while we watch bombs fly over <laughs> Israel and Palestine and we see children losing parents, parents losing children, and there's so much going on in this world, and we can just take care of the little bit that's happening right here. 
Black women need advocates. I don't like feeling like nobody cares. And I will not sit here and cry. I'm not going to do that. I've cried enough. I'm fighting now in love so that my child can have the art of of peace and be able to say to his friends, man, my parents were so utopian. They just had to get through a hard time. I'm so glad my mom reclaimed herself and her space in my life. And with every free inch of my body until my heart stops beating, I will be wherever I have to be to get that until it comes. And I'm now dedicating my life to making sure that other women, whether they make songs or sit in a library or a corrections officer or a housewife who's no longer a housewife who's now living in a shelter because she wasn't prepared and didn't fight because she loved too hard. And there are stories like that. I will be here for them. And I will support entities that support them. I love that. I love that. So thank you for having me and letting me tell my story. Um, (laughs) Because mine will be a victory. I believe that. So I am not a victim. And I'm here to let everybody else know that they aren't either. And if someone gives a damn about black women and all women who cannot be heard. I love that. Thank you for Thank you for that transparent moment and for sharing that and and for what you're doing. So, okay, so for anyone that's looking to follow you, subscribe, find you, stalk you, whatever, <laughs> whatever it is, drop all of the information so that people can follow, like, support you, all that great stuff. Absolutely. My name is Yazara, spelled Y-A-H-Z like zebra, A-R-A-H. Um, and all of my handles are at Yazara. Um, you can go on my website, yazara.com. You can find me on Spotify. You can find me on Instagram. You can find me on Apple Music and Pandora, as well as Tidal. I'm everywhere you buy your music. And um, my, my GoFundMe is also under my name. So just look for Yazara or Dana Williams, my legal, but don't you call me that in the street. I won't answer. Um, that's where I am. I love that. I love that. And Yazara is so patient because I probably missed said her name five times at the beginning. <laughs> so she's like, what? Holly, she, y'all. Holly has the case of Job. Okay. She, she supported me while I drove and through a tunnel, through the Holland tunnel. She helped me find a rest stop so that I could make sure I didn't look like Boo Boo the Fool while I poured out all my business to y'all. So love to you for being a sisterhood in that way for me. So we, we both pulled it together today. So I love you for that. Thank you. I love it. I love it. I love it. And so I will have all of her social media tags, how you can get in touch with her. Look at the podcast notes as well to make sure that you guys are able to click on those clickable links for anyone that's reading or uh, I mean, anyone that's driving, that's not listening or can't read whatever the clickable links will actually be in the podcast notes as well as on the social media links i'll have you tagged on everything so again thank you so much for sharing your story i know that it's extremely hard to talk about these these transparent moments where sometimes you feel like you are strong you do have it together and then life comes over and it just sweeps your feet from underneath you and you realize that you really ain't got it together and you need some help so sometimes that asking for help is very hard especially for women because we have these roles where we're bosses we're independent we don't need nobody and then all of a sudden you're like holy crap i do need somebody dang it (laughs) so yeah, and I, I definitely have suffered from strong black woman disease. Mm-hmm. Um, I am so incredibly grateful to God, to Ifa, to my ancestors, to my Egungun, to, to whatever looks above us um, for the, the help and the love of good friends and sisterhoods. Um, when you are dealing with something like this, it is super important to not pretend. Mm-hmm. Pretending is deadly. It is super important to not have somebody to talk to. That is deadly. Whether you whether you do something crazy or whether your your organs fail or whether, like me, I had fibroid in my belly for every year. I, I had been begging for my child to return. Seven of them. Last week I had my last procedure of UFE after having been diagnosed with fibroids at the age of 16. Um, and I'm saying to all of my sisters out there, whether you're going through this or whether it's a toxic environment on your job, be good to yourself, invest in your self-care and fight for that fiercely because 
If you don't, you won't be here. I love that. I love that. Okay. Well, you guys, that's your motivation for today. She had not just not just custody stuff, mental health. We did everything all, all over health. Keep it pushing. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So thank you so much again for telling your story.